Hey, g'day and welcome back to part 4 of the Mixi Clock build. I wanted this video to be primarily about some of the metal finishing processes that I used in completion of the clock. One of the processes that always gives me grief is the anodizing process. I found out during this video that it wasn't so much to do with my power supply or the anodizing solution that I was using, it was more about the grade of aluminium that I was choosing to use in the process. So let's have a look at what I learned and some of the solutions to your anodizing problems that you might be having. And then later on, we'll have a look at the final assembly of the clock. Well, I thought that would never end, but um, I've got all of the turned aluminium parts done now. That's uh, one leg assembly and we'll have um, one of these decorative rings on the bottom, one on the top. There'll be a cap with three socket head cap screws, and that will be um, there'll be four of those, one at each corner. The um, alloy parts are going to be done in a mixture of anodizing and powder coating. Initially, I was going to do all of the leg parts, so these sections here, uh, in black anodized finish, and I did a test piece. Um, this piece has been in black dye for uh, over 24 hours now and it's come out this really disgusting sort of, I don't know what that is, that's gold and it's supposed to be black. Now I've tried that in both um, the recommended RIT liquid dye and I've also tried in Caswell uh, black anodizing dye, neither of which worked. So um, I'm going to cut my losses and I'm going to do these in a uh, powder coat colour called Sterling Charcoal. These rings are all going to be uh, anodising gold. Now the gold I've got to work. It's, it's working reliably. That's a part that was done there. Don't know why. It's just one of those things and uh, I'm tired of sort of chasing my tail trying to make it work. So. Um, what I'll do next is I'll demo both the anodizing process and also I'll just give you a quick look at the powder coat process, but I've shown that before. The one thing I've probably learned about powder coating recently is that um, ordinary old Ajax is probably one of the best materials for prepping your parts before they get powder coated. Um, I've watched a YouTube video by a gentleman named Dan Gelbart, who's a bit of a guru on all things to do with prototyping and uh, he explained that the best way to prep a part for powder coating is firstly to sandblast it. If you can't sandblast it, uh, the next best option is just use um, Ajax. So I just put it on a toothbrush and the idea is that um, the Ajax will prepare the surface by activating it <clears throat> and what that means is that after you finish this process and you wet the material, the uh, water will stick to the surface through basically a, an atomic reaction. And of course anything that you put on top of that surface like a paint or a powder coat will thoroughly wet the surface as well. So there's less chance of that finish delaminating later. And it doesn't take a lot of work, it's just really just scrubbing the whole thing all over and then doing the old water break test on it. So if you flood it with water and it doesn't bead, then it's ready. Uh, I had used metalate spirits and acetone and uh, paint thinner, all sorts of things, but I have had occasions when the powder coat's chipped off later and really that shouldn't happen. So just give them a bit of a scrub like that. And you don't have to go too hard at it. And then when you wet that, You can see the water just flows over that surface and doesn't bead at all. So I'll do all of those parts. Oh, and before you get all judgy on me, uh, this is not my kitchen sink. This is the shop sink. So yes, it looks a bit disgusting. I actually cleaned it up for you before I did this. 
So I'm going to get all these prepped, uh, then I'll wire them all up, ready to hang in the oven. And uh, this time I'm going to try and do them all at the same time. So I'll get them all coated and just hang them on a bar. And then when I'm ready, I'll put the whole lot in the oven at the same time. That makes it much easier to keep track of the, the time that they've been in there. When you're adding them one after the other and taking them out at odd times, it sort of gets a bit hard to track. So anyway, let me do this and then we'll do some powder coating. So this is the, uh, the basic setup uh, that I'm using for powder coating. This is one of these uh, Eastwood uh, powder coating systems. Uh, this is the single voltage gun. You can get a dual voltage, uh, which is better for um, trying to put powder inside openings. Um, but this one, for what I do, is fine. The, um, the powder I'm using today is um, called Sterling Charcoal. I got this from Amazon. It's really hard to buy here in Australia anymore. In fact, it's just about impossible in small quantities anyway. The, um, the amount of powder I have in there is probably about four or five tablespoons, and that's more than enough to do this job. It seems wasteful uh, when you look at the amount of powder that ends up on the floor, or if you're using a um, sort of a spray booth, you clog up the filters very quickly with it. But um, in reality, the cost is probably lower than using paints because you're not having to add thinners, you're not having to buy expensive two-pack paints to get the same quality uh, of result. So although, yes, you lose a lot of powder, um, the uh, upside is that you get a, a really professional looking finish and um, you know, if you can buy the powder at the right price, the problem here in Australia is we have to pay uh, an exorbitant shipping fee to get it out of the US. But if you could buy it at the right price, um, I think you can't beat it really. So we'll hook up the air. Uh, the air that you use is uh, very low pressure. And the only thing that you do need to have is a fairly good earth uh, on your hanging wire that you're putting your parts on. Okay, so I've had the parts baking in the oven just to dry off the water. Um, so I'll do a couple and show you how that works. But um, if you look back at my previous video on the spot welder build, um, I demonstrate the powder cutting process there as well. So I'm going to just shoot this one. It's been in the oven just um, allowing it to dry off uh, or any moisture that might have been on that part. You can see it straight away the powder is attracted to that surface. The hard part is getting it in the counter bores. Okay, so I didn't shoot powder around the back of that because that's going up against a mating surface anyway. And let's see if I can turn that around. You can see that the powder is actually being pulled around the back by the electrostatic charge. So this is the oven that I'm using. It's just a domestic oven that I modified. Um, I got parts in there just hanging on a bar. The legs, the taller parts, uh, still a bit got a bit of moisture in the hole, so I'm just going to leave them a bit longer. But the, uh, the four little caps there. The one on the right's just starting to go glossy, and they call that flow out. So when that powder becomes liquefied, it's about 10 minutes at 200 degrees C. Let it cool down, and it's done. So this is the last one. I reckon that the, the prep on these took about 10 minutes. That's just getting the metal ready. About five minutes to attach all of the wires. Probably 10 minutes to put the powder on and then just your time in the oven. And because these are already hot, they've actually been in the oven just drying off. If you uh, bump it accidentally, uh, the powder has already fused slightly to the surface of the metal, so it makes it a bit safer. If you, if you do bump it or you get a gust of breeze, it can blow the powder off. Uh, these need another three or four minutes. You see they've gone glossy. They're looking good. So there it is, that's cooled down now. 
and you might be able to see that the powder hasn't really made it to the bottom of the counterboards. Uh, that's a particular problem with powder coating, it's because of the Faraday effect and that's, this is where the low voltage or the dual voltage guns do a better job. But I think by the time these cap screws go in there There you go. I don't think anybody's going to notice. So given the amount of time I spent on that, it's way, way less than I would have had to do if I was anodizing and the results are much more predictable. The colour's about what I expected. Um, so, all good. Well, those parts just came out of the oven and it's still hot actually, but um, they came out pretty good. The um, full assembly looks like that. The, uh, the rings are still quite an easy fit on those columns there. I was sort of worried that the powder coat might have added some thickness to that, but it seems to be fine. So the last step now is to get these uh, two rings anodized, and that's the part I'm not looking forward to. It's always problematic. It takes literally days to get it all done because it's got to be uh, prepped and it's got to be chemically clean. It's got to go in the tank for about an hour and a half and it's difficult to get all eight of those in there at the same time. Then uh, it takes an hour and a half to actually grow the anodizing film and then it can take up to 24 hours in the dye to get the depth of colour that I need. So I'm not looking forward to that at all. The powder coat on the other hand is quick, it's reliable, it's uh, predictable. The colour that you get is easy to work out and uh, the clean up is just so much easier. Oh, and, uh, for the record, there's the amount of powder that's left on the floor after that process and I can just blow that outside with the compressed air or sweep it up, put it in the bin but it's certainly a lot easier to clean up than paint. Done! Well this is my anodizing bath. Uh, it's just a plastic tub with a lid so that I can cover it up and keep the uh, evaporation rate down. There is a um, an aerator in the bottom of the tank if I need it, but I, so far I haven't found it necessary. The uh, stainless steel trolley, oh geez, <laughs> I have bought this on eBay and uh, supposedly, allegedly stainless steel, but as you can see it's, well it's stained is what it is. Oh, damn, I gave that bugger five stars too. Anyway, uh, this just allows me to wheel it out of the way when I'm not using it. Um, I have it, this set up under the house um, because I wasn't happy about having acid fumes uh, in my workshop where I've got lots of metal surfaces and uh, uh, plus I don't have a lot of room over there. I have had a lot of issues with the anodizing process and I suspected that the acid solution that I was using was uh, somehow contaminated. I read a uh, post on the internet about using a different chemical uh, rather than sulfuric acid. Over here I find that sulfuric acid is almost impossible to get. Um, I tried to get some from the auto parts store and I was basically interrogated like a terrorist uh, with them wanting to know why I needed acid. Um, this stuff is readily available from the, the pool shop it's um, sodium bisulfate and uh, it's relatively cheap three kilos makes up 15 liters of anodizing solution and uh, it's less toxic and less harmful than sulfuric acid so uh, I mixed some of that up, put it in the bath, I ran two parts in it and they came out just fine so I'm going to try that again so the first step in prepping these parts before they go in the bath is to etch them in caustic soda or sodium hydroxide or lye, whatever you want to call it. And the idea is to leave them in until 
you see fine bubbles coming off the surface and this just etches off the last of the oxide that's formed on the aluminium. It, the oxide coating can form very very quickly only takes minutes basically and uh, the idea is that you etch that off rinse it with demineralized water and then get it straight in the anodizing bath so I just see uh, fine bubbles coming off that now obviously you don't want to leave it for too long so it does destroy the polished coating so I just put the other three in there and the idea now is you just give that a good rinse and that can just hang on that bar the power supply that I'm using is a 30 volt 5 amp constant current or constant voltage power supply um, I can set this to 15 volts and then dial in the amperage that I want so what we're sort of looking for here is uh, some very very fine bubbles coming off the part which is the anode and the cathode uh, I've got my torch down in there. Cathode should be surrounded by um, a mist of very fine bubbles, which is hydrogen being given off. So, provided you see that, then in theory everything's going well. The problem with doing multiple parts at the same time is that any one of them can not be getting a connection, and you won't know until you put in the dye bath that the anodizing has failed. So about all you can do in that case is uh, strip it in caustic soda, put it back, do it again. So this is my gold dye solution it's looking a bit manky down at the bottom but it's still working okay. And of course every time I watch this on YouTube um, people put their parts in the dye and they just instantly change colour. And for me that never happens, it can take up to 24 hours. So either everyone's lying or I'm doing something wrong but I do eventually get the colour that I want so I'm just going to leave these to soak you can heat the solution up which makes it a bit quicker but you run the risk of sealing the pores on the aluminium if you overheat it so I usually just prefer to let it soak cold so we'll check back <coughs> tomorrow and just see if there's been any colour change. Well here we are the next day um, these haven't been in quite 24 hours yet um, so this is about half past 11 in the morning and they went into the bath here say about 3 o'clock that's the colour that I'm trying to replicate so they're getting close and I'll leave these till this afternoon and I think they'll be done but interestingly this is one that I thought I had anodized, went in the bath with the other three in the same batch and it's absolutely nothing. So clearly that one didn't get a good electrical connection and it's going to have to be done again. This is the, the frustrating part of it, you know, you invest a lot of time, take the part out and realize that it just didn't work. Well, I don't know if I can put this off much longer. Um, what I need to do here is to mill a pocket in the front of the clock assembly to tape this ring and it's a very flimsy sort of setup um, I've got to go 37 millimeters diameter 10 roughly 10 millimeters deep um, and I've got to cut through all three layers of the timber and I'm gonna to have to skim the top layers of the acrylic so I'm cutting dissimilar materials it's as rigid as I can dare to make it without crushing anything um, I've got the material sitting in the bottom of the vise, so I've got a bit of composite board at the front here just to stiffen up that front plate. And I'm going to be using a quarter inch uh, wood router bit as my cutter. So I've got a, a centre marked out here and with the edge finder I'm just going to try and locate that centre. It doesn't have to be super super precise but I'll try and get it close. So I've got one of these pendants uh, which will allow me to get pretty close. So I'll just uh, run this up to speed.
bit on the X. Okay. So I figure that to be dead on center, so I'm going to zero my DROs on the uh, machine controller, set up the cutter, and see what happens. This, this could all end in tears. Alright, so I've set my uh, X and Y to zero over that center point, and what I need to do now is set my Z, and I'm just a bit worried about damaging the timber so I'll just put a bit of blue painters tape on there so that I can just touch off on the tape. So So I'm just going to use the quill to set the Z. Lock the quill there. So I'm going to set my Z to zero and just bring that up again. So the tool path I've got set up is a just a straight out pocketing operation. I'm going super super conservative with the um, depth of cut. It's uh, one and a half millimeters uh, per step, and uh, it's going to start from the center and work its way up. So I'm going to run my spindle as fast as I can go, uh, which is about two and a half thousand RPM. And uh, if I hopefully just taking light cuts will be good. The bit that I'm worried about is when we get close to the acrylic, you know, whether that's going to chip. So um, I'm also going undersize on the diameter, and once I've got the center cleared, I can go around just doing a profile and just keep increasing it, you know, a tiny bit at a time until I get that ring to just fit. So, wish me luck, this could all end really badly. So I'm just using my manual data input to get to zero uh, for X and Y. It's always worth checking that just to make sure you haven't done anything stupid. Okay, so let's see what happens. Let's do this uh, in single step mode just to start with. That's encouraging. Um, I've only just done the first pass there. Oh, I just want to check the finish on that. Okay, that's pretty good. So I, I have actually gone undersized by probably a millimeter, but I can bring that out as I go along. So I'll just let the whole program run now and just see what happens. That's not finished. Um, 
I was getting a bit nervous about the vibration that I could hear in the centre here. So what I'm going to do is I'll put a, I'm going to put a clamp across these surfaces at the top to try and pull them together, and I'll run the program again. But stand by. All right. So I just put a, an F clamp on there to uh, try and compress these layers a bit more. I've, inside, I've got a block of wood uh, which is sort of supporting the, these acrylic layers and the centre plate. Um, just because I was worried about the vibration. So I'll run this program again and then we'll catch up uh, when it's just about to finish up. chipping a uh, bit of chipping over on this edge here but the acrylic cut really really well that surprised me now I'm, I'm about a millimeter undersized so what I'll do is I'm just going to go around with a, an inside profile and I'll do a climb cut so hopefully this won't chip so badly over here and I'm just going to slowly bring it out to the correct size um, the other thing that's going to happen is when I release this clamp, it's going to it's just going to spread apart slightly. So um, I'm going to have my pocket so it's just a tiny bit undersized, and then when it naturally springs open, it should hold that part quite easily. So it wasn't a disaster yet. That's very close. Now I'm at 36.27. So I'll go another half a millimeter um, and do another spiral, and that's probably going to be it. If I need to adjust it, I'll probably just use a Dremel or something just to uh, tweak it. Right, well that's sort of fitting in there, it's a little bit tight on the, across these two edges here but I'm just going to trim that out I think. I don't want it to be super loose when it goes in there. So, oh there it goes, no, there it is. That's it, cool. So there it is, a bit of cleaning up to do, but that's looking sweet, yay! Ah, look what I found in the cupboard, um, this stuff's called Vero board, um, I forgot I even had this. This stuff, if you were doing electronics back in the 70s and early 80s, this was pretty much the only way you could make prototype circuits in those days. Um, the thing that I have to do is make a, uh, an attachment for this tactile switch which is going to control the functions of the clock and I also need to be able to attach the light dependent resistor into the circuit so 
Um, I was lucky I found this because I was going to make a, a one-off circuit board for both these little tiny parts but um, what I'll do is I'll cut a circular disc uh, from this material and fit it up underneath the, the top of the clock where those parts will go so there'll be one on this corner and one on this corner and uh, it's going to make the whole job way easier so um, there you go, Vero board, didn't know I still had that so what I've done with this piece of Vero board is um, I've roughly cut a circular piece from that corner and I want to make this perfectly circular on the lathe so what I've done is I've made a mandrel uh, which will allow me to clamp this between the mandrel and a pressure plate and then we can turn that perfectly circular. The little tactile switch is going to fit uh, around this central hole so I can show you here around the central hole and the four terminals will fit uh, one hole spacing around that center so when the switch is in place it'll be perfectly circular the 16 millimeter diameter piece of board is going to fit into a pocket um, on the underside of the top plate of the clock and there's a little LDR and it'll be fitted in a similar way. Um, I'm just going to fit it to a hole either side of the center. So let's head over to the lathe and we'll have a look at how we do this process. So what I've done here is I've chucked a piece of aluminium alloy and I've faced that off and I've left a little tiny pin uh, in the center of that and the center pin of the Vero board will just simply fit over that and that just sits there. Then from the same stock I've machined this little washer and I've just put a piece of masking tape on that just so it doesn't scratch the tracks on the Vero board and that's going to sit there and it's basically just going to be held in place by pressure from the tail stock. So provided we just take really light cuts that's going to be just spun around by friction alone and I can measure that with the calipers and when I've got it right it'll just fit into the pocket. So I've used this method before for machining plastic and brass and um, materials that you can cut without taking really really hefty cuts. Um, if it's got a tendency to spin you can put double sided tape on one side. I've also done it with um, hot glue um, where you can't have the pin in the center but you can actually just hot glue the stock to the chuck and you use a blowtorch just to bring that material up to temperature just smear on the, the glue stick and then put your part on and back it up with a washer on the other side So there we go, that's one custom made Vero board. So there's the finished product and on the back I've got enough tracks that I can make the connections with the, the leads that will go to the circuit board.
Well that's it, another epic build finished, and it turned out rather well if I do say so myself. Hope you've enjoyed watching this series on the Nixie Clock build, and I hope you've been inspired to try something like this for yourself, but most of all, I hope you've learned something. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, and for now, thanks for watching.